I, uh, I'm from Cleveland originally, and I worked at a newspaper to pay my way through college. Worked a bunch of jobs, but one of them was uh, in newspaper. And I stayed uh, at the Cleveland Plain Dealer for a few years, and then I switched to television, but I didn't really get television, so I moved to New York, went to graduate school at Columbia, and learned all about how to write for television, how to produce television, and, um, and then I hung around this one TV station there, WPIS, on weekends, and I still didn't get it. You know, it's just different. For me, I have to see what's going on. So I hung around, hung around, and I, and I, I uh, practiced writing, and they looked at my writing, and they hired me right after I graduated. So um, I got right into television and you know, it, was a, it was a small newsroom. I worked for the local station uh, there and the network there. And uh, then I, uh, one day there were no reporters in the newsroom and there was a breaker and it was the middle of the day. And they said, well, who should we send? And they said, well, how about her? She used to be a print reporter. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so I was like, okay. And to this day, I cannot tell you what the story was because you know how you sort of go in that thing? Um, I was just in that fog where all instinct, and I did the story. I don't remember what it was to this day, but I got it done and they hired me to freelance, but I still had to do my old job as a writer, but I got paid $15 a story. Wow. <laughs> but with Diane, that, I gotta I can... ask you real quick. I mean, yeah, I know you were doing it like right off the cuff that day, but were you nervous or you figured you had nothing to lose kind of attitude? What was going through your mind? I don't remember. I think because I'd worked in print and I learned how to do TV, it just instinct took over. I don't remember anything. Isn't wow. that bizarre? Nothing. Well, was that probably the best thing if you would have had time to think about it and get all nervous? Like you said, right? you just went into a zone and you let it rip. And from there, you know, kind of the rest is history. You mentioned not getting TV. Can you explain a little bit more about what you meant by that? Because maybe I've been not getting TV for the last 58 years and <laughs> I could have watched it differently. Yeah, no matter how yeah. long you you just don't get it. Um, <laughs> TV is different. Uh, you learn how to write in different uh, formats. Newspaper is one way. Um, okay. Then when you move to TV, you don't have to describe anything because the pictures are there, right? So in print, you have to say it was a foggy day. They were coming down the street. There was a crack in the sidewalk. Well, TV, you have the pictures to say all that for you. So it's half the battle. And then you have to speak to people. You know, to me, TV is a lazy entertainment. You sit in your chair and you watch TV. You want to be fed and entertained. You don't want to have to do any work. In newspaper, you have to read. You have to go back and, you know, decipher what you read or something like that. Maybe read a couple times. So TV is, to me, is easier once you figure out how to do it. Okay. Um, there's ways to make the picture speak for you, that sort of thing. Magazine is different too, um, but TV, and, and now I'm doing, and we'll go back to this later, but now I learned how to write different for what I'm doing now. It's, it's uh, if, you, if, you do, if you follow those kind of rules, you can be successful, but you can't be a newspaper writer and write for television. And vice you were versa. always great at the writing part, though, right? You were always a great writer. I'm a good writer. Thank you very much. But I think it's because of my background in print. Um, they teach you how to write. They teach you how to ask questions. And they and you can put the story together. In TV, sometimes people think you can just roll up and, you know, just do it. But there, there's an art to it. And some people are better at it than others. Well, that's why you hear, well, first of all, young kids don't read because that you have to be involved as a form of entertainment there you know i had the you know you had talked about in prior conversation about your back injury and stuff and when i had the shoulder in the sling there were just you look for other avenues and you start reading and right. you realize the entertainment value and how much more mentally you have to be engaged if you're reading whether it's a newspaper or a book and draw and make some of your own pictures versus the laziness or watching tv or, or you know back in the day, um, a radio broadcast from a baseball game, painting a picture of the wind or what the picture looks like. And all of those things are a lot different than guys nowadays, right? For TV broadcasters, just there's more silence or, you know, for my world, way too much analytics, just spewing numbers at me that 
I don't need that. So I, I see now what you're talking about in terms of the difference with regards to how much more you have to be engaged intellectually to be able to enjoy, appreciate those. Well, and think about it. When you read, you have to use your imagination and you can't be a good writer unless you enjoy reading, I think. Um, and because then you learn how to describe things. And I'll tell you where uh, my favorites, uh, my favorites were Sports Illustrated. Uh, those guys, can they can write. I mean, those were my favorites. And that's sort of where I got my style from. Um, wow. Action, they have to write action because sports is action. Nobody wants to read it if they feel like, you know, they're not really being, they're not at the game. And they're not feeling the pressure of the hitter or whatever. Um, so those guys really, they can write. But you, you know, it's almost that, like, it's almost like the radio announcer, you know, like you were saying, Mark and Diane, where, you know, he's bringing that baseball game to you and you're envisioning it. And like you said about the Sports Illustrated, you, you're almost, you want to be there in that field. Yeah. And write. yeah. yeah. You know, and, they, and even, um, do you remember that radio show I used to listen to when I was in traffic, going home late at night? The Shadow, remember The Shadow? It's, it came the on- shadow <laughs> The Shadow Knows. The Shadow Knows. I love that program because you felt the tingling, you know, when he was describing what was happening. It's sort of like when you watch Psycho, the black and white versus yeah. Psycho, the movie. It was much more scary in black and white. It was just- sure. like, Right. Because it was scary in here right. much more because you were forced to, to be much more engaged in that situation. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. That's, and the Sports Illustrated piece too, the, the Frank DeFords and all of those guys who now have, have and, and sometimes you get the cop out, everybody just wants to go to numbers because right. it's, it's nice and easy. Six is more than five. And, and here's the, you know, they throw, here's the spin rate. Here's how many curveballs. I don't, uh, I want to know what was going on behind that and, and what the pitcher and the catcher were thinking and, and doing all those types of things. So definitely, um, I think there's, to your point, a, um, a bit of laziness out there in various forms of media, but those are the generations now who are consuming that, right? So now you have yeah. to, can you change your audience or do you just change to conform to your audience? I think you have to change with the audience, but I think you have to bring a certain amount of creativity to um, maintain who you are and your style, but make it um, modern so that you can appeal to not just one second because you're stuck mm -hmm. in that you, you're who you are and you're of the 80s or the 90s, but you have to bring that sort of flavor to what's happening now. And, uh, and I, think, I, I think that there's the people who are doing really well I think they understand that and they stay fresh. But how do you, you know, we had uh, a, a guy you might remember by the name of Mark Jean Greco on a little <laughs> while ago. And, and we'll try to bring you back up to speed on but who that guy was. But it was <laughs> funny because you start to look because things change so fast. You look to your children for keeping you in, in you know, keeping you in line with social media with how to use certain devices, whether it's your, you know, your iPhone or, or, you know, your Fitbit or whatever it is, but they kind of drag you back in to go, okay, here's how we're going to have to connect. Or you find younger people that you encounter in the workplace and go, wait a second, I can't communicate with them and be able to relate to them. From my perspective, I've got to change to be able to do that. Right. And then, you know, they're so of the generation of everything is instant for them. So they're not very patient. My son's 23. And so I have to like grab something that he likes just to keep his attention to show me how to do stuff. <laughs> and sometimes at first he would go move because I just, you know, you're like, what are you talking about? But they're wired that way. That's how they grew up. Um, but then when you get into it, it's so much fun. But uh, I'll tell you the funny thing about it. And, and I love sports. I grew up watching sports, playing sports. And the funniest thing to me now is, um, you know, well, to me anyway, there, were, there weren't that many unbelievable guys and unbelievable women in every sport. Now, because of social media, because you can watch all these games and because they, you know, each generation takes things to another level, but there's it's so blown up. many it's blown up. of them. It's, there's so many of them. I'm like, who is that? It's, it's amazing. So uh, it's really fun to be able to um, be exposed to all that and learn uh, 
everything that's out there. And I just wish that in our day we had social media because we'd have gone wild. <laughs> well, maybe Question you know for you, Diane. Um 1985 here now you're in chicago and it's abc time um what goes through your mind here you're you know coming to this city um now you're gonna come on this uh, network uh take us through that i mean just take us through the beginnings and wow. through the abc years the start here in chicago so uh i came to abc uh, in january 85 and that was when there was that record cold day 27 below and I remember saying, what is this place? <laughs> and I always thought, after zero, how bad could it be? Right? <laughs> and then Thanks for coming, Diane. <laughs> it, was, it was crazy. So I get there and, you know, I was working in Columbus, Ohio right before that, where there were probably, you know, 15 people maybe. And there was like 200 people in this newsroom. And um, they were all very um, Hollywood looking to me very, you know, everybody was beautiful, they dressed really well, they were, um, they were fun. Um, and so I was, I was nervous because here I was from Columbus, Ohio. And then I remember someone asked me, do you think you can work in this town, little lady or something like that? And I was like, what? That's <laughs> so, Chicago. Yes. So I want to say it was like my first or second day and they said, okay, well, enough of orientation get out there. So I got sent on a story. And just like when I did my first story, I do remember it was a fire, but I don't remember much after that. But um, they were shocked that I could do it. Um, and so when I came back, they said, wow, I'm thinking to myself, it's, a, it's just a fire. I didn't, I'm not going to win like Peabody or something, but um, <laughs> right. they were shocked that I could do it because I'd only been in television really for a year. Um, so it was, you know, working there, I will say was, uh, you know, it was trial by fire. They just throw you in there and you, you either sink or swim. And, um, and I was lucky enough to be able to uh, watch everything in real time and figure out what was going on. Oh, because also they don't tell you anything. You just like have to go, oh, wait, you know, and then you have to just jump in and figure it out. Um, well, was there to that end, I know, you know, you go to different parts of the country and people recognize right away Chicago. Well, they talk real fast. They this, that, or the other thing. And you pick that up. And I'm sure that was real quick coming out of Columbus. But was there somebody that was willing to be um, a mentor, whether they liked it or not, or somebody you kind of said, hey, this is the person I want to try to be able to emulate and I'm going to bug them until I get the information that I want? Or did, did no one want to be able to do that for you? Um, well, I would say it started in New York. When I was in New York, there was a woman named Pat Harper. She was the main anchor, and she was this beautiful, just elegant, blonde woman with these steely blue eyes, and um, she wore stilettos, and she would walk through the newsroom just like a queen. <laughs> and, well, you know, and so she it. took me under her wing, and she was telling me all these things, you know, about television and um, find out who you are on the set kind of thing and who you are in the field. You know, don't try to be someone else. And I was thinking, but I love you. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so I remembered that. And then she said, and also realized that there aren't many women who make it to, you know, the higher ranks. And so you have to, you know, maintain your credibility and you have to be better. You have to work harder. You have to do everything um, that people do and more. Always be ahead of the pack. And, and I'll tell you uh, what's interesting about that. Now, I worked with Mark Jim Greco, whoever he is. Um, I worked with him at the, at the, um, at the um, Bulls games, I want to say, um, the Cubs. But I know who I am. I'm not a stats person. I love sports, but I don't try to be ESPN with that, with those guys. I look for, like you said, I look for what's going on around it. I look at, um, I remember there was a, a general manager of the ba a baseball team. There were five female sports reporters covering the World Series, things like that. Um, how come they don't pay kids in college uh, who play sports? Issues more than this guy had you know, five rebounds. And this is what's 
probably bad about me is I could have been at the Super Bowl last year, couldn't tell you what the score was. <laughs> And I, and I might be pressed to tell you who was playing, <laughs> but I can tell you some other stuff that I was curious about um, that I could make a story out of. And that's where I made my living. I would go in when they said, hey, the World Series is coming. It looks like the Cubs are going to be in it. And you get chosen because of your ideas, right? And so at the first meeting, I would always challenge myself to have at least 15 ideas. And I'd already started working on the interviews. So I was going. It was a cinch. There's no way you could beat me with ideas for stories. So Diane, I got to ask you uh, and Mark this, this question. Do you remember the first time you went on, like on the five or the four or the ten o'clock news, when you anchored that first one? And you know, take us through that. Now you're going to be, you know, next to either John Drury or Joe Daly. Do you remember that first time? <laughs> you know, I never remember anything because I'm always like freaking out. But I remember my first day on the ten o'clock news and. I got in the studio early and I was, don't forget, I was in my 20s when I was doing the 10. Yes, so, I do. Yeah, so it was just, it was a big deal. And people would talk about it and say, how old is she? How could she be doing this show? And I'm like, I'm right here. You know, don't, <laughs> don't make me freak out already. So I went in the studio and John came in early too. And he said, I just wanted to come in and sit with you to, um, so that you feel comfortable. And so he was talking about the importance of just being who I am and not worrying about making mistakes because, um, and then the other guys had come in too and Jerry was great. And they said, if you make a mistake, realize we're gonna laugh at you. <laughs> Instead of, you know, correcting me and all that, they said, we're gonna laugh and then you can laugh and you can move on. Don't dwell on what happened. And he said, we're all here to protect each other. Just have fun. And then, when we got probably to the sports part of the show, he said, oh, I forgot to tell you, now that you're doing the 10, you're going to be surrounded by assassins. <laughs> <laughs> he was hilarious. He made me laugh every night. And it was a pleasure to go to work and do those shows because the things they talked about between, you know, segments and, you know, before the show, we'd hang out, we'd go out to dinner and uh, we really cared about each other, um, you know, cared about each other's lives and careers. And so it was a it was a special team to work with. It was really great. Well, obviously, as you said, uh, 1994, you're you're making history um, in your role there. Um, without getting off and into, a, I know we had a discussion about the ESPN situation and you having a couple of those things that made your career a little bit more challenging in terms of being black and being a woman. You know, it wasn't enough that you're a woman, but now you've got that other element to it. Um, talk a little bit about that. And did you feel any more pressure in 94 when everybody said, hey, you're the first African-American woman to have this position? Or you're just like, hey, I earned it. I'm here. Let's go. Um, no one told me that. And I had no idea that that I just assumed Chicago's a big city, big black population. I didn't realize that um, when I got there. I was the, except for Oprah, I was the only black woman on the air. And so, uh, and then, you know, you know how I am. It took me a minute to look around and say, oh, really? <laughs> um, so I didn't focus on that because there was so much to do. And I was just busy, busy, busy that I didn't focus on the, you know, historic aspect, which, you know, wouldn't have made any difference in, um, you know, I wouldn't have felt any more pressure because I know what my responsibilities are as, a woman, as a black woman, as a regular woman, as a reporter, as a whatever. I didn't really differentiate between any of them. Um, I had some, I had some challenges. I'm, I'm gonna be honest about that. That were, um, were in a word uh, for me being in my 20s and having lived in New York and all these places and, you know, just where I went to school and grew up. Um, I was pretty devastated by some of the things that were said to me. Um, and so uh, at one point I remember, um, I remember in, sitting in, in, at my desk and thinking that I wanted to leave. Um, and then someone I didn't know walked by my door and said quietly, don't let them kill your spirit. And it changed my whole life. And I thought, yeah, why should I leave? Because they're being mean to me. 
what, why should I leave? I've worked my whole career for this. And so I had to come out of, um, I was a kind of a shy person, you know, really? and I, I was, yeah, I'm still not that. I never would have thought. I know, isn't that funny? I was telling, I was telling my dentist, he was saying something and I said, you know, I'm not tough. And he goes, you're not tough? <laughs> and I'm like, no, I'm not. And I'm like, I'm really, I said, I speak for a living and I go up to people and have conversations with people because I want to know their story. But I don't, I'm not the, I'm not the, um, it's all about me when I walk in the room kind of person. I'm okay being over here talking to a couple people. Um, so it was difficult for me to, um, to stand up at first until um, one day someone said something to me and it was so offensive that it made me talk back. And I had to stand up for myself and I had to say, I'm not gonna have this anymore. And, uh, and it took a minute, um, but, and, I, and I'll tell you this, well, that was pretty raw. Um, when I got promoted to the 10, I was told I was promoted to the 10, but they weren't gonna announce that it was me. And I said, okay. And then one of the managers came in and told me that they needed two weeks because they needed to figure out whether black, uh, whether people would accept a black woman um, being on the news at 10 o'clock. And so, I mean, that hurt my feelings because I'm thinking this is the biggest promotion of my career. And now I'm not saying anything because I'm black. Um, so yeah, so that was hurtful. And, um, and it was tough. I mean, it was tough at seven. It was tough at two. Um, it was, it's a tough business and it's tough to me. It's what's wrong with our business because I think it's so personal and, and people in our business take swipes at people sometimes unnecessarily, um, based on maybe jealousy or, um, what grudges, I have no idea, but to me, the personal swipes turn people who are viewers against the media. And that's why that fake news caught on because you just give people the facts and they can figure it out. But all the opinions and, and then taking people down and making personal remarks about things, happy that people are falling down, happy that people are out. And then, you know, one of the, one of the Colin Kaepernick, uh, I remember uh, when Michael Vick went through the whole thing, I was mad at him about the dog thing, but you know, people in the media said he should never work again. He should be punished, but that's not up to, that's not up to the media to say that and start a campaign about that. If people want to protest, they protest. Uh, Colin Kaepernick, um, some of the, some of the, you know, anchors and sports guys, it was personal. I don't care how you feel. Just let me know why he did it and let him speak for himself. And then we can, I can think for myself what that means for me. I don't need to know what you think to tell me how to feel. I don't think it's fair. But that explains a lot in terms of your success, that that ego about a reporter or somebody sitting behind an anchor desk puts themselves ahead of whatever the story is, uh, whoever they're talking to. Um, I'll be the first one to admit this has been a, an amazing experience for John and I just oh. to finally tell yourself, hey, people aren't tuning in to listen to John and Mark. So you right. need to yeah. ask and let, I know you are, I know you are, but I thank you for that. But, you know, they're there for whomever else and you need to provide the ability to let that other person that guests, those group, group of people express who they are and tell you their story. And, and that's what I think we miss. Um, I think there's a lot of those people to your point right now that want to judge, um, you know, again, without getting off the rails, right? Stephen A. Smith now talked about the fact that Shohei Otani would be even a bigger star if he spoke English. And on some level he's right, because, wow. but you're like, if he could speak English and it didn't have to go through a translator, there would be something else. Now, Stephen A's problem is everything is three times larger than life. So he couldn't just expect to slide that in and go, it's Stephen A. Smith. No one will know what I said. 
And now, but again, it, they, it's canceled off. Stephen A. Smith, no, I shouldn't want to listen to him ever again. I right, maybe you need to rethink Stephen A. Okay, I, I can believe what I want to believe, but I've got to rein it in a little bit. Sorry, and we move on. And it's not the end of Stephen A. Smith. And that's where I think to your point again is people want to make themselves feel better about themselves by looking and trying to downgrade or just exactly. really degrade yes. somebody else. I totally but, but agree. Diana, not, not to change it a little bit here, uh, you had some great stories that you did that still are in my mind, fresh in my mind. Uh, one of the ones that touched me was when you did the war towards uh, Somalia episode. Oh, wow. And then uh, the interview with Mandela after he had been in prison uh, still stays with me. Um, and there was one that I think a lot of people forgot about. I think you were in Glenview, the suburb just north of me and Mark. Where you yeah, I saw the Glenview, right. Yeah, you were oh. outside of a mobile home with the bombing. I mean, your oh, resume God. is just incredible. And then how you depicted all this, what we were saying about, you know, the Kaepernick and everything else and, uh, and Michael Vick. I mean, is there one thing or a couple things that, you know, in your career, because the resume is unbelievable. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, what stands out? I mean, like I said, I, uh, I can remember yeah. so much of your career. There are a few things that stand out. It's funny that you mentioned that. Um, so uh, <laughs> I, I try to walk in other people's shoes based on, I, you know, I try to say, how would I feel if this happened to me? So one day I was at the Bulls game and Jerry Krause walked in and people were just booing and booing. And he kept walking, I'm watching him and I'm thinking, I'm not sure how I would feel if that happened to me. So I called him up one day and I said, hey, Jerry, <laughs> I said, do you mind if I came and did an interview with you? I just want to talk to you about you, you know. And I, and I tell people when I'm coming to work, I don't ambush people either. And so I said, I want to talk to you about your experience with at the stadium. I mean, I want to talk to, about how that feels. And of course he could have said no, but he said, sure, come over. So I went to his house and he and his wife were sitting there and in TV, they always promote the story that you will have. And they said, oh good, we're gonna put this on tomorrow. But I had been really sick for a couple of days, like really sick. And so the guy drives me over there, I'm in the back of the car going, oh my God, I'm not gonna make it. And so we get there and they're sitting on the couch and you know, everything was whatever, we were talking pleasantries. And then I said, so, and I asked him the question and you never know what you're going to get, but I was shocked. He started welling up and his wife was crying. He was crying. And I thought, you know, I knew it had to be painful, but I was surprised that he actually cried. Um, and that was uh, what, you know, one of the stories I just remember, and then in the paper it said that I put an unpopular person on TV that I had guts. I'm like, no, he had guts for being able to like show his emotion like that on TV. Um, what were a couple of other ones? Um, so I'm at the car dealership one day, and you know I like yap yap yap, as you know, and uh, about nothing. And so these guys are talking. That's what we're here for, believe me. <laughs> I, I could talk to the two of you like all day. Um, we got to get to the sports parenting thing too. Um, and so he's talking and, and all of a sudden he said, yeah, you know, I'm going, I think he said he's going to go shit full Jackson's car to California. And I'm like, oh yeah. And then I said, what's he got a place out there or something? They said, yeah, he's buying a place there. And I said, wow. I said, that's a place to that kind of schedule one for the weekend or something. And then he says, no, no, he's moving. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> and I said, like moving, moving. And he said, yeah. And then of course, you know, I go like this. Bye. <laughs> and I ran out. <laughs> uh, and Phil Jackson is really cool because if you just ask Phil a question, he'll answer it. And I'm like, are you leaving? And that's when he was going to the Lakers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think some of my best stories have been standing in line at the grocery store, sitting in the car dealership, just talking to people because that's, you always have something in common. If you talk to somebody long enough, you have something in common and everybody has a story to tell in my view. Um, it's just getting them to tell it. And if they do tell their story, they think that they're in that alone and you're never the only person that something happened to. So it's great to be able to tell people stories and have other people find that in common and also find a solution. So 
Yes. But that's a key right. to what you did in the sense that you made people feel like you cared about them because you did. And, you, and a lot of times you can't fake that. And they're like, okay, I want to open up because the, the fact that you ask and you feel it important enough to ask, I'll be glad to share. So, hey, um, you know, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about your extensive Hollywood career. Yeah, <laughs> you know it's it's funny. Um, you know, Richie. We got to get the stuff and, on Richard uh, Gere, Mark. Yeah. I want to know about when you're working uh, with Samuel L. Jackson, and my big one was the boss. Was the um, my favorite was the boss with Kelsey Grammer. Oh, yeah, with Kelsey Grammer on Stars. So mine's Richie yeah. Rich. Richie Rich, Rich, Rich. I know that's still on. You know. <laughs> I yeah, know. yeah. Well, we're we're really talking, yeah. <laughs> um, the funny thing about it is the only people I met, we never met anybody in Richie Rich because we were just in the studio. They came over after we did the show at like 1130 at night and they did our little parts. And then those are the only people I saw. Um, when we did Primal Fear, I never met anybody until many years later, I met Richard Gere, who's really cool. Um, and then Kelsey Grammer, since I was there all the time, I, you know, I had the nerve to walk up and talk to him. But it was, a, it was, they were all different experiences, but all really great. It's really fun. If you ever get a chance to be, if I'm on another set, you gotta come over there. Um, because it's really exciting to watch. Like Boss was shot over on the West Side in a big warehouse and they made it look like City Hall. It looked just like City Hall, but in a room, this big room and uh, like a warehouse floor, and then over in the corner was the mayor's office. And it looked just like the mayor's office. So it was amazing um, how they can recreate those things just and shoot the whole thing in a war. May I ask you, Diane, how were you approached for these movies? Because of your boring personality or what? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, who did you talk to in line at the grocery store? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. There I am going, why would you talk to me? I'm lonely. <laughs> no, no, how, did, how does it happen? So uh, Primal Fear, they probably called the station for that. And then after you do a couple of them, um, uh, honestly, I think the directors figure out or the production companies figure out who's pretty easy. And, um, you know, we're easygoing and stuff. And so we said 1130, no worries, we'll be there. And, and it was quick and they're fun. And then for Boss, though, I was walking down the street, down Chicago Avenue. And uh, this guy came up and he said, hey, I worked on Negotiator. He worked on something. And he said that he had spoken to me like briefly you know, on a break or something. He goes, do you want to be in this new production? I'm like, sure. So that's how I wound up in Boss. It was just like, wow. yeah. But there's, you know, uh, there's like casting agents around in Chicago. One of the bigger ones is Claire Simon. And they're always like auditioning. I know people who are in Chicago PD, Chicago Fire, all these things, and they're extras. And so I look for people that I know in the background of these shows. But yeah, there's the opportunities, but it doesn't pay anything. For if you if you talk, you get paid. But if you're just an extra, it's like fifty bucks. I enjoy watching the uh, like Chicago stuff because you always want to pick out to see if it's actually authentic or not. Like yes. which way they're going down a street, or if I've been there before, or whatever the case is. So, all right, we're going to switch again in our professional interview skill sets here. Um, <laughs> travel, sport, parents. John coached hockey. He's an Illinois Hockey Hall of Famer. I know. Uh, I had a, a uh, travel hockey player, um, travel baseball. So we're going to give you the floor for the next 10 minutes to let go on travel. Let go. Thereof. <laughs> First of all, let me say hockey. Hockey, I don't remember what the story was as usual, but I was doing a story and I was interviewing one of the Blackhawks. And he said, come on over, but I have to, uh, I have to do my workout while I'm doing an interview. So he gets on this bike and I started interviewing him and he's writing this thing like writing it and he's doing an interview like nothing and so wow. hockey guys at cardio yes in fact i went out with a hockey player in high school so i they, they get great legs and i'm like you know if they just <laughs> if they wouldn't wear those puffy outfits they'd have so many fans <laughs> well and stop knocking people's teeth out <laughs> yeah, that's part of the appeal for some people too so greatest condition bodies of any sport i'm telling you so yeah anyway uh what was i talking about so <laughs> so uh travel travel anything i mean my son played uh baseball all growing up which i'd still miss sitting in that chair watching the games and you know 
it's entertaining. And I'm going to write a piece about uh, that, this whole experience that we've all had. Um, because being a baseball parent, there's certain, you know, there's certain parents, <laughs> there's, there's certain parents and there's certain fans and there's certain players that just make it one giant family. It's sort of dysfunctional, but mm -hmm. you know, they get somewhere. But you know, Ryan, uh, my son played on, you know, he played on like, I call it the United Nations of teams. And the funniest was like, you know, he played on a black team where the, you know, one of the moms would come with, you know, um, cornbread or something. And we're like, we didn't think that's a good thing to have before the game. And he played on an all Italian team. Uh, hey. The one mom would come and say, "You got to have these meatballs. You got to have the meatballs." And they go, "You can't bring that to the dugout." And she goes, yeah, you'll be in the "What are you you'll, talking about?" Yeah. You're running you the tell, yeah. you tell your mom what she can or can't serve, <laughs> and when she can or can't serve it. No doubt about it. See, I think there's a reality show. Very, I know they did it like on dance, but you could do a book or a reality show on some travel. I know, John, you can speak to hockey, right? You had your first tournament like in September and it had nothing to do with the kids. It was exactly. packing the parents up to figure out which parents weren't going to get along. Oh, who brought the best. It was that feel out tournament. Yeah. Things, so. yeah. And the parents hold on are. One second. I'm sorry. Hold on one second. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I don't know if I'm having a. <laughs> hey. No way. Yeah! <laughs> Thanks for coming on, Mark. Mark. Dude. <laughs> Can you hear the surprise, Diane? Hmm? Here's He's our trying. surprise, our, our good old buddy Mark G and Greco. Yeah, he he probably needs an assistant. You know, he's not used to doing his technical stuff himself. <laughs> <laughs> he's got people for that. No, well, yo. He, there we got you now, Mark. How are you? D, how you doing, babe? I'm fantastic. Good to see you. Great to see you. I see the guys already ran out of guests. <laughs> 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 yeah, but we could be on here like every week because we never run out of things to talk about with them. I, I know. This this could be our show. Let's just take over their show. We'll call it yeah, Marky Mark, Mark, Mark Diane John. We'll call it Marky hey. Mark, Diane John. All I know is right now. When Mark was on our show, his shirt didn't have a collar, ah. but because you're on, he has a starched collared shirt. That's all yeah, I need. Step it up, step it up a notch. If Mark yeah, and I, I had a show, it would be called What the Just Happened. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I miss you a lot. You know, you and I text a lot and we've talked a lot during these past five or six tumultuous months. And I just appreciate all your support so much as a great friend. Oh, you're you know? awesome. I mean, I, whenever I talked to you, it's like it was yesterday. I was just telling the guys that it was a pleasure to come to work because we had so much fun. I mean, we well, had I don't know if I told you guys, but the thing that Diane and I used to love to do is I'd walk in the newsroom and she'd be standing there talking to some people and we would race to the makeup room. <laughs> like, like, we would look at each other and just start, you know, moving, start jumping like that. And we would race to the makeup room, shove each other out of the way, knock people over. I mean, that's what we did every day. They thought we were crazy, which we weren't. No, I know. So what are you doing? I know you're working on a lot of great projects. But... Are you talking to me? <laughs> yeah, I'm talking to you. I'm taking over the show. Oh, okay. okay. So, uh, yeah, so I'm actually working on, um, I'm going to shoot a documentary pretty soon in Chicago. We're going to start filming about, um, you know, there's so much going on there with crime. But this is about, uh, this is about a group of NBA players who, have been mentoring some kids there. And this I haven't told anyone, by the way. I'm um, oh. mentoring some kids there. And it's uh, a look at these kids years later and what's happened to them. And they've come from some really just dangerous neighborhoods and they talk about what they've been through. But um, with the help of these guys, they've made it to college. Um, some of them are business owners. And so it's a very uplifting story on the, uh, on the back end. Um, so. Wow. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that we should have been doing back in the day when you and I worked together because that problem existed back then. It still exists today. You know, I've been here 40 years and I love the city, but, you know, I'm in the South Loop. It's getting to be pretty dangerous and uh, it's just not the same. It's kind of ungovernable, unmanageable. And 
you know, I voted for the mayor and I was really cheering for her, but, you know, she's got her hands full and it, it's like chaos here, you know, and it, it really transcends anything else you're interested in, sports included, you know? I know it's, a, you know, I hear from people there all the time and when I come there, it doesn't look the same. It's not as vibrant. If something's got to happen because taxes are too high, people are sad, um, and, you know, and people cling to sports because it's a way of escaping whatever's happening. You know, COVID happened, everything happened, and there's got to be something bright at the end of it because, you know, we've got a bad reputation there. Oh, awful. How about this? You and I run for mayor and vice mayor. Yeah, but you know how people look when they go into the White House and then when they come out of the White House? <laughs> <laughs> Mark, oh, great. Can we, can me and Mark, Mark, can me and Mark be part of your cabinet with you and Diane? Can we be Absolutely. part of it? Absolutely. Yeah, well, Diane, Diane's going to be the mayor. I'm just going to take a position to where if I screw up, I can just sneak out and don't, I don't take any heat, you know. <laughs> no, I just be my answer to everything. I don't know. Time. It's it's listen. Scary. Hey, listen, I don't want to take it too much time, but I just wanted to jump in and I appreciate the opportunity. I got to run out to dinner. I'm having- uh, Thank you, Mark. Uh, Mark, yeah, I'm having thank dinner you so with, much. Uh, I'm having dinner with uh, Joe Spivak, who was my former intern, plays defensive tackle for Northwestern. He's bringing their new starting quarterback, Andrew Marty. We're going to Chicago Cut with Joe's dad. So I'm really excited about that. Oh, uh, wow. To go out with all these dudes. But I just wanted to say to you guys, I said it when I- was on your show this woman right here is such a great friend she jumped to my defense in two seconds and just reminded me of how much fun it is when you're working with a super smart super secure badass uh instead of people who use this cancel culture now to just you know cover up all their deficiencies and i just appreciate diane so much so well, before babe, you go, two things yeah um mark well said mark well said yeah. Mark is, Mark is like the best. And, and I told you guys, he's like my brother. And, you know, you have to be ready for him because he's coming for you. And, <laughs> <laughs> but he comes for you because he wants you to get him. And so I'm, all, I'm like, I'll, I'll oblige you. I'll get you in a second. I mean, we go back and forth. And, you know, it's if he says something that I can't answer, then I'm like, okay, he got me. Okay. You know, I'm going to come back tomorrow. And it's all good. But yeah. Mark was great. And I was telling them how, you know, we work together, you know, covering sports stuff. And, you know, I don't know stats. Mark let me, he let me be who I am. And that's looking past the numbers or doing whatever. And then we just came together and, you know, we did our shows from there and we weren't competing against each other. We were competing against everyone else and it worked. And that's why um, I want to ask you a question before you go there. Just yeah. feels what's, what's he going to be like for Chicago? Well, um, the kid is great. He's super smart. He's off the chart, charts and all the Wonderlook interviews. Uh, he's not only football smart, he's just a really, really sharp individual in every asset of life. He's a born leader. He's got a great arm. He can run. He has everything. This is finally the quarterback Nat, Matt Nagy wanted. So there's no excuses for him anymore. We'll see if he can actually coach. Um, but I think you know, the Bears are really capable of ruining this kid, too. So oh. we'll see. What <laughs> Why? From the pressure of it all? And do you compare him to anybody? Mark, thank before? God you said it, not us. So <laughs> yeah, you know, just, uh, I mean, you're not going to start him. You know, Matt Nagy comes out and says that. And then, you know, we're going to take it slow with him. We're going to do this. We got to protect him. Their old line is very suspect. I mean, it's hard enough. I don't care how great you were in college. It's hard enough to adapt to the speed of the NFL, especially at the quarterback position when you have to learn a whole new system. Uh, I just hope he prevails, but I don't have any faith in the coaching staff or the ownership there at all. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because they're cheap or because why don't they want to? Well, they haven't done anything right in a long time and they've never had a quarterback per se. And Matt Nagy, I loved him when he came aboard because John Fox was just, he hated the media he was just old school, give you a generic nothing in every interview. And Matt Nagy was this young, vibrant, energetic, creative guy who was really transparent. But now it's devolved into it's just word salad. I mean, he just talks in circles. So I need to see some results. And yeah, it's a lot of pressure on the kid. But I would start him game one, not game four right. or whenever, whenever Andy Dalton gets hurt, you know. Let's not do the same thing they did with Glennon. They started Glennon and then brought in Trubisky. It's the same crap, right? Yeah. Well, I'm excited to go to, uh, 
I'm I miss you on TV. It. We need you. Uh, oh, he's you know what? Uh, let me just let me just say this right now. At this point in time, it could change. Die, I'm done. I, I I just I can't ever see myself doing it again. It's like I never did it. I have all these great memories, but right now I'm just excited about doing something completely different. That could change next week. I'll let you know. <laughs> but. No, go, wait a second. He's going where NBC Sports? <laughs> no. Yeah, but right now I watch. I never watched local TV news for the past fifteen years. Even the show that I was on, I just worried <laughs> about. I just worried about my particular segment. But it's all the same, and nobody's watching, and it's really a dead platform. And so, if I want to get back into media, it's going to be something completely different. You know? Yeah, remember say, we used to like be raw raw because we had ratings like 24 now they're happy to have like a five it's five are you kidding me five would be monumental whoever oh. wins the 10 o'clock news now the last two books got a 1.3 no way yeah when you and i worked together we used to get 17s and 20s so just wow. just think of it that way hey, the top gary five. deeb just joined the show yeah the the top five well not top the five local TV news stations in town are vying for a total of 200,000 viewers. And what separates the number one station from the number two station is 200 viewers. That's a high school podcast. That's, know, right? that's nothing. So, you know, D, you and I need to work on a project and get it out somewhere where people are going to watch it. Absolutely. I'm going to send Mark on the way out. The one thing that I took away genuinely from when Mark was on when he talked about it is how comfortable he is in his skin right now and how much he just wants to be. Yeah. We talked about the, the travel sport parent and all those things and now being a, a, a grandpa and all. And it still gives me chills, Mark, because I look forward to that phase of my life to be able to do that. So um, all the best on that, man. And thanks for joining Thank us again. Thank you, yeah, Mark. I want to say something to Diane before we close off here, Mark. Thank you. For the surprise we wanted to surprise you. I know. And I gotta say, Diane, I Diane, I want to just say for coming on angles and attitude like Mark did a couple of weeks ago for us, G and Greco. Thank you so much, Lady D. From the bottom of my heart, I followed you from the beginning, those <laughs> Chicago days, to now when you went to CBS. You're you're nothing but class. I want you back in Chicago, baby. I want uh, you back here. Yes. Thank so, you. We miss you. We miss you and. I don't know how to thank you for coming on Angles and Attitude with me and Mark and uh, Mark G and Greco. Yeah, we went back to being the what, best dressed man here again tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm running out right now. I don't know. This shirt could be coming off tonight. It could get dangerous with these football players. Oh, I love it. Have fun. Mark. I love you all. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for stopping by, Mark. See you, D. Love you. See Mark, you guys. Bye, bye. Bye. Take care, Mark. Thank you. Well, how about that for? Ah, oh, that was so awesome. That was sweet of you. Thank you. I was like, who's popping in there? Ah, I, um, I told you he's great. Yes. Offline, <laughs> I will explain to you how we were able to engineer that. So, but again, to John's point, we could go on and, and I, I, we we're so surprised a lot of times when people such as yourself go, yeah, come on, we'll be on. And, and we're like, okay, if we can go like 15 minutes, we'll be happy with that. And and <laughs> now people are like, well, let's go for another 45 yeah. or whatever. So you're, it welcome, fast, doesn't it? you're welcome back anytime. We'd love to have you. Um, sure. You know, if you're selling something or you want to come back and talk about the documentary or we can oh, yeah. deliver meatballs to when you're filming the documentary. <laughs> I'll, bring clips. I'll bring a clip too. You can put it on. I'll send it to you because you I go. think we it's really going to be special. Well, I'm happy. We definitely got to do a part two, Di. We definitely. Okay. Gotta... Yeah. Because there's so much that we didn't talk about. You know that. Um, sure. Yeah. You got that right. All right. So, well, you be you stay well. Try to uh, stay out of the humidity in California, and we will talk soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.